Okay, folks, I've been wanting to make this video for a couple weeks. Um, it's about Travis and Tay Tay. Tay Tay, Travis Kelsey, and Taylor Swift. I'm going to look at their compatibility. We don't have birth times, but we have birth dates, and we can do a lot with those things. Um, so we're going to talk about that. Might be surprised to see what you find out. And this is the day before the Super Bowl here in um, 2024. So check this out please find me on youtube at sam jeppy vedic astrology teacher on there since 2007 thousands of hours of classes also on facebook at astrology teacher tons of articles updated regularly and i'm on instagram at vedic astrology 108 ongoing updates and interaction we have these two charts here and here at the bottom i have their exact birth times you see kelsey was born on october 5th 1989 and Swift born on December 13th 1989 you see these times are a little you know one is 4 a.m. one is 2:29 p.m. we don't have the exact birth time so we don't know the ascendant we don't know the rising sign and I looked very closely particularly when I get down here to the Veda Kuta scores um, his moon in Jeshta and her moon in Ardra are likely not to change based on the um, birth times because it went into Ardra. She was this time it says here is 4 a.m. and that's very early Ardra. So it would have been an Ardra pretty much the whole day. Same way with Kelsey. It's right kind of in the middle of Jeshta and he was born around the middle of the day. So these are likely the right nakshatras. Even if they're not the right nakshatras for the moon compatibility, we could definitely see with the regular synastry. Now we don't have the ascendant. So that's one thing we don't have. So I don't know what their rising signs are. And that, of course, makes a difference, right? Because that can that can and will modify the things that I see here based on synastry. But the synastry is <laughs> a bit challenging, to say the least, particularly as it relates to the real pillars of compatibility. And, you know, I've developed a system called 3D Vedic relationship astrology where I assess the individual's chart first particularly around the things related to masculine and feminine energy which underpins a lot of relationship astrology and then the synastry between the two people that's the second prong so the first prong is an individual's capacity to feel good in relationship that's the first D of the 3D the second D is then you lay that chart on top of the chart of another person, which is called synastry, and you look and see what buttons are getting pushed. And then the third D is the Vedic Kuta matching, which are based on the lunar nakshatras primarily. So I'm going to go through here. Here to the left, is that the left or the right? That's the right. Uh, right. Yeah, see, I'm <laughs> terrible. All right, From, it's my right. It might be your left as you're looking at it. I don't really know. I get right and left confused all the time. Okay, anyway, so this blue strip has the synastry where I talk about the masculine and feminine when you lay one chart on top of the other. But first I'll just look at their general masculine feminine tendency, right, and their capacities. Um, and I'm really, in many ways, kind of simplifying it. The simplified kind of 80-20 version, which is the 20% that gets you 80% of the result would be to look at the masculine planets for the man and the feminine planets for the woman to see their relative comfort with their masculine and feminine energy and then just the sort of overall balance. Now again, it's going to change if we know the ascendant, but we don't and and we don't here, but we could still get a lot done. So let's start with Travis Kelsey, of course, he's a he's a football player for the Kansas City Chiefs. Looks like a real nice guy, a real knucklehead. That's what I like to call guys like him, a real knucklehead. Not just because he's a jock. There's a lot of musicians who are knuckleheads, but he definitely qualifies as a real knucklehead. And that's okay. I have a lot of friends who are knuckleheads. In fact, I'm a knucklehead. <laughs> if you really knew the truth. <laughs> anyway, seems like a good guy. Um, of course, he's also become like ridiculed of, as like Mr. Pfizer or something because he advocates, you know, vaccines. <gasps> Shock. Anyway, so these two have become an object of ridicule. And again, just real quick, you know, there's a lot of indications around things like royalty right now. 
royalty, kings, leaders. Look at all of the focus that's been put on that in the last couple of weeks, like with King Charles of England, even in the United States election with Trump and Biden, and who's going to be the next king, the leader, the big one. Well, these are the real monarchs right now. Taylor Swift is like the queen of the world with her amazingly successful career, right? And then she started dating, you know, the football star, you know, Travis Kelsey. He's going to the Super Bowl, which is like the, you know, so these two are like real royalty to like most of the world, right? Aside from the political royalty. So it's, I'm just drawing a quick comparison because we're seeing these things very exacerbated right now, right? This kind of, um, um, you know, these power, these power couples, power figures vying for power. So within that context, Travis Kelsey is like, you know, he's landed the queen, right? So let's look at him. By the way, they're in the Super Bowl and his team's called the Chiefs, right? Chiefs, which is sort of like, you know, a king, right? Against the 49ers. <laughs> I've been drawing some comparisons. 49ers, right? That refers to gold when they struck gold in California in 1849. And we just started the year of the dragon, right? Dragons were protecting gold, right? So if you slayed the dragon, you got the gold. See how it's all connected? All connected. We're opening these portals of, of you know, 6D energy. That's what this is all about. Okay, anyway. Back to Earth. Travis Kelsey. Look at his masculine planet. So he's got... That's Sun, Mars, and Jupiter. So he's got Sun and Mars in Virgo, feminine sign. It's with Mercury, the ruler. So again, makes a very detailed, structured. And it, but his masculine energy is in the sign of Virgo, which is quite, uh, you know, kind of you know finicky, persnickety. You know, it's ruled by Mercury. So you see, Mercury is there. So this is kind of why he's you know seems to have a good sense of humor, smiles easily. Actually, if you see clips of him when he was on Saturday Night Live, he was actually quite a good actor. He acted certain parts, and he did a really good job, right? It was pretty, you know, pretty amazing for, you know, for a knucklehead jock. And he's a knucklehead. He didn't do a bad job, right? So Mercury is a good mimic, right? And then Jupiter, his other masculine planet, is in Gemini, which is also ruled by Mercury, but it's in a masculine sign. So this masculine planet in the masculine sign, the most masculine one in the masculine sign is the Jupiter and Gemini. But the other thing is he does have the two masculine planets joined here, the Sun and Mars. They're very close. Mars is combust. So again, you can see the real power that could come from being like an athlete and things like that with this Mars-Saturn, Mars-Sun conjunction, also with Mercury, again, because that's the ruler. So you can see that kind of... Um, masculine concentration of power mars sun together but again it's feminine sign so what this means is it's not that sort of confidence and again this is like in himself like inside this is like an inner game right we could do all kinds of things again like he might have an aries ascendant or leo ascendant or sagittarius or something like that or even you know like aquarius or something and, and that masculine energy is more reinforced, for example. But you could still see a lot with planets and signs, right? So his masculine is not as confident, especially, again, you would say, well, he's a football player. Yeah, but we're talking about, like, with, like, women or with when it's, when we're talking about relationships, we bring our masculine and feminine into contrast with the opposite gender, right? But we also, we don't know Travis Kelsey as a person. Maybe when he gets a around other men relative to like, you know, again, I'm not talking about having physical athleticism and prowess and competition. That comes from a lot of things. It comes from the third house. Again, even if he had a cancer ascendant, let's say, that would still be very feminine, but he would then have Mars, Sun, um, Mercury in the third house, which would make him actually very competitive. Mars and Sun in the third, with the third Lord, would actually show where if you get him on the football field, he's very competitive, right? So these things aren't black and white. They're very nuanced. Um, so, I'm not, so you can't judge by what we know. This is inside internal stuff where he would, where his, you know, clarity of vision and purpose and power and discipline and all, again, when he knows what to do, when he has like a very methodical plan, which is Virgo, then, he, then it really keeps him on track. But again, men get around women, that whole thing kind of goes out the window, right? You're like... You know, women are challenging for men, right? So anyway, you could see how 
in a masculine context, especially around like women, again, he's famous, so he can have a lot of opportunity, but his masculine, he can kind of defer. This is often what it happens. It can mean just that. Like he can kind of defer and, and be like, okay, okay, uh, you know, yes, dear, whatever you want, whatever you want, and kind of be in the background, a subordinate role. So his masculine relative to being in contrast with a woman is kind of pushed down. Now we look at Taylor, Taylor Swift, okay, and, um, you know, by the way, his feminine planets are very strong. Venus, Merc Venus, Moon are in Scorpio. Now, yes, the Moon's debilitated in Scorpio, but it's a feminine sign, and Venus is in the feminine sign. So he's got a lot of planets in feminine signs here. Sun, look at all these planets in Virgo and Scorpio. A lot of feminine energy, right? So he's very comfortable in his feminine. I'm sure he's very sensitive and sweet, sweet person underneath it all relative to those things, right? He's very comfortable in the heart, probably loves the music and the beauty. And, and again, this is the thing all women want, that sensitive guy. He's definitely what you would call the sensitive guy for a knucklehead jock. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help it. Okay, now we look at Taylor Swift and her masculine and feminine. Well, if, if we look at her feminine first, well, she's got the moon in Gemini. That's the feminine planet in the masculine sign with a masculine planet, Jupiter, okay? Let's look at her feminine, her other feminine planet, which is Venus. Okay, that's in Capricorn. All right, so that's a feminine. It's with Rahu, though. So again, now it's, you know, Rahu is really expressing that Venus. It's really exploding a little bit. So she's got one feminine planet in the masculine sign with a masculine planet. And then... She's got Venus in Capricorn, where it's actually quite earthy, quite grounded, quite commitment-oriented. That's why she seems to, you know, she seems to have, I mean, she's a young, famous, beautiful woman. So it, it, it wouldn't be fair to judge her like others. But she seems to go into one committed relationship after another. She seems to have had quite a few. But this is just because we also know her. It's really no more than anybody else, probably. But you could see that potentially fickle nature with that moon in Gemini join Jupiter. Now, again, this isn't a criticism because her work is very important, her vision, her purpose. She actually, I don't really know, I couldn't hum one of her songs right now. Um, but I've seen her off and on. I've listened to some of her songs before, and she seems to be trying to do her best, you know, do things that are conscious, that have a message, that are uplifting and whatnot. And, um, you know, she has this moon-Jupiter conjunction. This is why she's a very inspiring person. So, you know, more power to her out there being successful and, you know, you know, doing her thing. Um, uh, so why should she settle or anything like that? So, again, it's definitely no criticism like, oh, she goes from one relationship to another. She's Taylor Swift. She can do what she wants and she can expect and demand what she wants, etc. cetera. Um, but in general, you know, the masculine feminine energy here, by the way, is you know, reasonably balanced. It doesn't have to be where both feminine planets are in the feminine signs or whatever. You have to look and see. But you're really looking at the comfort with the person's masculine or feminine nature. We looked at Travis Kelsey's, and again, his masculine planets all being in the feminine signs, what I what I pointed out is what I what I indicate well, they're not all because Jupiter is in Gemini, right? So that's the one that he's most comfortable with, right? He's most comfortable with that Jupiter with that Jupiter in Gemini, which is like leading by, for, you know, with ideas, inspiration. That's the masculine planet in the masculine sign. The other two are a little bit, are not as much. But Jupiter is also, it's not the real powerful sovereign masculine energies like Sun and Mars. It's more, it's inspiring, but it's also, um, you know, it's more like that sort of benevolent nature, which is good. That shows where he's, co he's, he's confident in that part of his masculine. With Taylor Swift, again, she's more confident in the part of her feminine that is Capricorn. Again, it's also ruled by Rahu. I'm sorry, it's also joined Rahu, which, again, Capricorn is about let's make it formal and committed and serious. So she takes these, she takes her relationships quite seriously. Like when she gets, again, Venus is the indicator of sexuality and all of that. She won't, she won't, she's not just like, oh, you know, anybody, anything or whatever. It's, it's a serious commitment to her, and she has probably some pretty traditional core values around relationships and things like that. Again, the moon is more of a 
you know, the moon is more consciousness in general, but it's the capacity to feel and what she, what she's look, how she's looking to feel in general. She wants things to be fair. She wants things to be, she wants to be heard. She, she, again, she's very aware of people being, you know, uh, listened to and, and that includes her partners and whatnot as well. So her moon Jupiter up here in Gemini puts the masculine planet, uh, puts the feminine planet in the masculine sign. So it's more of a balance with, I mean, both of them have, I guess you could say both of them have a relative balance between masculine and feminine, but Travis Kelsey's masculine is definitely a little more concerning just because it's Sun and Mars both in Virgo, and Virgo is really not masculine. It's really quite um, where it's being criticized and questioned quite a bit, for example. Hers is a little more grounded and landed in her feminine. Um, so, again, a reasonable balance, but she also has, it's very interesting, they both have Sun-Mars conjunctions, right, which is in itself a very masculine placement. Hers is in Scorpio, in Mars-ruled signs. So when you start looking at her masculine, even relative to his masculine, hers is much more <laughs> developed in this sense. Again, Scorpio is a feminine sign, but it's ruled by Mars, right? He's got Sun-Mars conjunction, but it's in Virgo. It's ruled by Mercury. Mercury neutralizes gender. Mercury and Saturn neutralize gender. They're neuter planets, right? And Virgo is a feminine sign, but Mercury tends to neutralize the gender charge, right? Scorpio is ruled by Mars, so it, it, it accentuates the the emotional courage to like take things on like she's got an enormous emotional courage it's not just mars is there but the sun is there so this is an enormously powerful part of her nature probably the most powerful part because it's the ruling it's a planet in its own sign and it's ruling the sun so again we don't know the ascendance so then when we look at their connection their their synastry we see a masculine and feminine reversal being shown in pretty much every place we look for it. The masculine feminine is reversed. Note the shortest emotional distance is from her to him. She is in the initiating role. It's best when the man is. This has to do with the moons especially, right? Her moon in Gemini only takes six signs to get to his moon in Scorpio, right? One, two, three, four, five, six to his moon, where his moon takes eight to get here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the shortest distance is from her to him. Now six eight is is a, is as far away from Sri Dirg as you can get without it being an opposition, which is then okay. So it's a wide Sri Dirg. Sri Dirg is the term for this, but it's still there. The shortest distance is from her to him, which means her emotional energy gets to him first. I'll come back to that. But by the way, that tendency is what makes a woman tend to feel like she's mommying him and he's being nagged because her energy gets to him very quick and she wants his energy to get to her quick. When a man's energy gets to a woman really quick, she doesn't feel nagged or whatever. She feels, you know, taken care of and seen and appreciated because he's there all the time and she feels his energy and attention and he wants to give it and she likes receiving it. It's different for men where always feel like the woman's energy is there. It, it feels kind of nagging to the man and draining to the woman. It's that nagging, mommying feeling, right? That comes, it can come right from street deer because that's one indicator of it, this distance. But again, it's 6'8", so it's not as urgent. Like for example, if her moon was in Virgo, it would be like three, and then his would take 11. That would be very, very urgent street deer where it's right there. This one, it's 6'8", but it's still there. But what you really see now, this is the rest where it starts to get, this part is not good relative to masculine feminine. They have both the Sun, Moon, and Venus, Mars connection, right? By the way, I've seen a lot of astrologers that'll be like, oh, Sun, Moon, Venus, Mars conjunction, that's great. Well, it happens to be her Sun on his Moon, her Mars on his Venus, but, you know, no, 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 no. It's not all the same. They have a Sun, Moon, Venus, Mars conjunction, but it's her Sun and Mars on his Moon and Venus. And yes, if it's good one way, 
If you want to say it's good, then it's bad the other. If it's great to have the man's sun on the woman's moon, which it is, man's sun on woman's moon reinforces the same thing I just said. It's like the man's energy getting to the woman really quick and her liking it and reflecting it back and reflecting back that she likes it, right? It's a symbiotic relationship. It's as old as time. The sun is bright, powerful. The moon reflects it back. So the man's sun on the woman's moon reinforces the gender comfort, right? Woman's sun on man's moon means it's opposite. It's like the woman is the sun and the man is having to reflect back to the woman. That's what they have. You see her sun on his moon and it's very close. Both of these conjunctions are close. Her sun is 27 of Scorpio. Now we're not exactly sure the birth time, but it's probably it's somewhere in Scorpio, probably probably 20, you know, uh Jeshta goes from 16 to 30. So it's somewhere here. It's within a few degrees of her moon, her sun exactly on his moon. So it's like she's the masculine, he's the feminine. Her Mars, 255 of Scorpio, his Venus, three. This is exact. Exact conjunction of her Mars on his Venus. Again, Mars and Venus are literally like the sex planets. You know, without being too graphic, Mars is like the part of the man who's like, okay, I want to, you know, bend you over a piece of furniture. And Venus is like, okay. It's like literally the masculine feminine, like in the sort of um, <laughs> sexuality type of thing, the very active Venus. Yeah, am I attractive? Mars is like, yeah, you are, baby. Right? It's that kind of masculine man, animal, woman. Yeah, let me attract the animal with my Venus. They have it backwards. So it's like if she was the, yeah, I want to bend you over one. And he's like, okay. It's like, so it's it's when it's reversed. So again, this is what the synastry shows. It shows who's the initiator, the conquest, the like, yeah. Uh, and who is the, okay. And so when you get them reversed, they're reversed. So, ugh, as it says here, yikes, exactly opposite. So this is the mommy energy for a woman and smother energy of a man. It looks, even just the Stree Deerg would do that. Even just the Sun Moon being reversed would bring that. Even Ma Mars Venus would bring that. Any of them can bring that feeling of the, of the pole being reversed. By the way, you usually don't see it. And you often don't see either, you don't see any of it often particularly an exact Sun, Moon, or exact Mars, Venus. And anytime you see any of those, you want to notice, is the circuit correct? Like when you see a man's Mars right on the woman's Venus, you know that's going to be a very deep connection. And on again, it's not just the sexuality, but it's everything that's implied by that. It's the trust, to trust a man, let's say, to do that, to be that intimate, to be that... And again, that's not the only thing that brings it, but... These masculine-feminine connections through the luminaries or through Mars-Venus bring a deep kind of like literal like animal trust or feeling protected, feeling safe with the person, feeling loved and, and seen and supported, the sun-moon, right? It's primal. And so when you see any of those circuits, you want to see first if it's there, then you want to see which one is in the masculine and the feminine role. You love to see man-sun, woman-moon, but again, woman, sun, man, moon is still a very strong glue, but it's reversed. It's kind of like the mommy, right? So it's you don't need a birth time to see this. So then if we look at the Vedic Kutas course, this is the third prong where you assess the nakshatras. You can see I already have like Mr. Orange Face over here going, shocking. This three points, shockingly low. Now you see all of these different indicators that are possible and the ma and the scores that are possible. Nadi means the element. So I'll just read through here because I actually explain each one. But you see all of these points that are gained, zero in all of these placements. A half on, on Grahamaitri and then a few of these up here, Tara, Vaisya, and Varna. But they also didn't subtract for for the Stridirk. But so only four points out of a possible 36. So as it says here, three points is shockingly low. This comes from having a nadi element imbalance. As it says here, nadi is adya or adi, which is wind. 
And with the Nadi Kuta, you want to have them be different. If one is wind, you want the other one to be phlegm or whatever it might be. When you have both, it's an imbalance. So they're both windy in their head, right? And then, um, so that would have given them eight points. It's also an inimical moon house connection. The 6-8 connection would have, get, if it wasn't that, if it was a favorable um, house connection, they would have gotten seven points, but they don't get any points because it's unfavorable, 6-8. Very poor Ghana, the temperament, which is six points. So again, we have with him, he's the Rakshasha and she's the Manusha, which is Rakshasha is like the eccentric one and Manusha is like the humanistic one. Um, so, so they didn't get those six points. Then the Graha Maitra, which means planetary friendliness, the friendliness between their rulers, okay? So his nakshatra is Scorpio, you see over here, um, and hers is Gemini, which is unfriendly, or one is unfriendly toward the other, and the other one is neutral, which is only a half a point. And then the other two down here, so again, only a half a point out of a possible 27 points. So we don't just look at the Kuta scores, we look at why they're low. And here they have an imbalance in that windy, naughty. So when things happen, they can both get in their head. And it makes for like unbalanced, you know, ungrounded, like, well, I don't know, I don't know, and kind of vata disorder. The Bhavakuta, the Scorpio Gemini, again, in that 6 8 relationship, Scorpio and Gemini don't really have much to do with each other. His moon is in Scorpio, again, which is very emotional, um, devotional potentially, and, and hers is in Gemini, which is like also trying to figure things out intellectually, very different emotional style, that 6-8 style. The Gana, again, the Rakshasha and the Manusha, he's Rakshasha, which is eccentric, unpredictable, like, okay, this, you know, and hers is Manusha, which is, okay, let's be practical, let's figure it out, let's... You know, what's the plan? You know, that kind of thing. And like, I don't know, well, maybe this, maybe that, right? Rakshasha is a bit rebellious and uncertain and eccentric. And the Manusha likes things to be, okay, let's be calm, steady, what's going on? And then Graha Maitre, again, Mars, Mercury are also just not very favorable. It's not just that it's 6-8, because some 6-8 relationships are fine. For example, the Mars ruled signs, you know, you have... Aries and Scorpio are 6-8 from each other, and the planets are great friends because it's the same planet, their ruling planet. But here, Mars and Mercury are not. They don't really share anything. Mars is about getting somewhere, being in a hurry. Mercury is about playfulness. So you don't see a lot of compatibility when you look at the specifics of the Kuta compatibility. So... Man, this is shockingly low when you look at the Veda Kuta scores. When you look at the compatibility, again, you see connection here, especially the Sun, Mars, Venus, Moon, but it's backwards. It's also in Scorpio, which is like, <laughs> you could see this like intense, like, yeah, we're like, ah. but then I can see over time, again, we don't have good birth time, so I don't know how that's how the ascendants would modify it, but I think it's hard connection to, to stay together. There's too much combustible energy here. The biggest connection is clearly the Scorpio stuff. His Jupiter is also on her moon. That's the only real other synastry point. Again, she's got Saturn, Mercury in, in Sagittarius. He's got Saturn there. But these Saturn, Jupiter are more because of the year they were born. But his Jupiter is on her moon, and her Jupiter is on her moon as well. So that feels good and they share that Jupiter but the biggest sinistry connections are is all this Scorpio energy and it's reversed again now if it was hit if this if this was reversed and it was his Sun Mars on her Venus moon in Scorpio that would be I'd say you'll never pull these two apart <laughs> that's what I would say it's it I don't everything else Street Deard all that other stuff it would be very hard to pull them apart because that's such a deep bond. Man's sun on woman's moon, man's Mars on woman's Venus. It's very strong. Here, when it's reverse, it's still a lot of glue because it's a big connection, but it's like a reverse connection. So anyway, I like both of them. I think they're cool. Um, I like how, you know, I don't care about 
I don't have an investment in any of the the weird political stuff. Now it's been a big deal because she's like, you know, political. She she was against Trump, so of course that's set the world on fire. And he, you know, again he made commercials about get a vaccination. So again, you know, he's Mister Pfizer or whatever the heck it is. So all that's nonsense in this age to me. It's all silliness. That doesn't mean I like or dislike them as people. I want the best for everybody, and they both seem like nice, reasonably normal people who just want to have a good time in their life. You know, they're famous celebrities, so they also are eating up the, you know, they're liking that part of it. That's, you know, part of the thing. But, you know, I wouldn't, it's, it would be fine to watch them have a, have a great relationship and, and have things work out well. I'd love to see it. This is a tough connection, though. By the way, I also want to say this. It doesn't mean it won't last, because sometimes these are the connections that the people want. For example, some uh, like a woman with all this powerful masculine energy, this Mars sun, his Venus moon in Scorpio, it's like it gives her somebody to like maybe sort of baby a little bit. The thing is, is these things get hard to maintain, though. Him, all his masculine energy, which is a little bit, falters a little bit because it's in Scorpio, I mean in Virgo particularly, you know, her masculine energy on his on his feminine plants because he's more comfortable in his feminine could be very supported by her masculine energy, right? But you want to know that it, it can get hard to maintain over a long period of time. It can feel draining. But for some people, it I'm not going to say it doesn't work. It can work. But it's definitely it's definitely showing the thing I'm pointing out. If they don't feel it yet, which they probably feel some of it now, they'll feel it soon. To, for lack of a better way to put it, she's kind of like the leader. And it's it usually feels better when the woman sees the man as a leader and he sees himself as the leader. But sometimes people have faltering energies and the other one's energies really, you know, really support it and, and you know, hold it up. And that keeps people together. And again, never underestimate that Sun, Moon, Mars, Venus can be a very, it is a very powerful glue. But it's kind of like the powerful glue that's in reverse. It can still be a very strong glue, but within that, there could be quite a bit of confusion. So for a limited time, I'm offering 10 hours of master classes, yoga and Vedic astrology, quantum Vedic astrology, and spiritual astrology master class. These are three great courses that will really help you a lot. Now, in case you don't know who I am, I taught the AstroVed certification course on Dr. Treya Shiva Baba in 2010. Ravi Shankar published my book in 2018. I've been around for decades. I've been teaching these great classes. And if you go to VedicAstrologyEssentials.com, you can get this 90% off discount of these three great classes, more than 10 hours, guaranteed value. You can uh, check this out. These three classes will give you all the necessary tools to begin to learn Vedic Astrology. Please find me on YouTube at Sam Jeppy, Vedic Astrology Teacher, on there since 2007, thousands of hours of classes. Also on Facebook at Astrology Teacher, tons of articles updated regularly, and I'm on Instagram at Vedic Astrology 108, ongoing updates and interaction.